welcome everyone to another episode of hashtag real talk with me your host Aaron Bregg your guide through this wonderful and mysterious and craziness world of information security uh, today's guest is Dave Stikos he is a senior security engineer for an incredibly awesome wonderful healthcare system in West Michigan called Spectrum Health uh, today's topic is is a day in the life of a SOC analyst. So for the regular listeners, there's been a couple episodes this year we've, we've talked about, or last year we had um, Jim Kaifoff on to talk about different things that he's experienced as a healthcare leader, as a healthcare security leader. Um, and then just a month ago, we had one of your um, peers on, Josh Gino, to talk about like what it's like to actually be inside a ransomware attack. And that got me kind of thinking to where, you know, we talked about like specific incidents, but what does it look like, right? What does a SOC analyst look like? Because so much in the industry right now, people are, you know, the movies tout like hackers, right? Like you get to see everything happening in a second or, you know, the, the glorious pen testers, they, you know, they get all the love. But in the end, it's the SOC analyst that's actually in the trenches, uh, doing, you know, doing the stressful stuff. So I'm going to be quiet. Uh, Dave, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background in information security. Sure. Well, thanks for having me on, Aaron. Um, yeah, as Aaron said, my name is Dave Stikos. I've, I've been a technologist of one kind or another ever since I bought my first microcomputer in the seventh grade uh, and moved up to an Apple II and uh, and uh, I uh, uh, took to software development was you know we didn't have security as a pra a career practice uh, back in the 80s when I was coming up so I graduated from Western Michigan University go Broncos uh, with my uh, computer science degree and was um, for the most part, uh, for the first 20 years of my career was an embedded software developer. Uh, uh, what that is, is in, although I did develop apps like you would run on your PC, embedded mm -hmm. software is the software that you generally don't see that runs all the little uh, get gadgets and gizmos like, you know, in uh, VCRs and robots and things like that. People don't tend to think about the software. Or industrial and, control systems. <laughs> exactly. It was industrial controls was exactly where I found my uh, my niche. Uh, I did a stint for uh, uh, GE Aviation, working on flight management systems, uh, and uh, for uh, another industrial control company here in Grand Rapids, uh, yep, automating robots and conveyor systems. And uh, it taught me a lot of discipline in what I was doing because uh, these are systems that have to often run without fail 24-7. And uh, so uh, they, they you, you learn good coding practices or you just get woken up in the middle of the night an awful lot. And <laughs> you learn, uh, you're saying you learn quickly. It was you, a very you, defensive. You might, you might push not great code, but after months and months of being uh, with those phone calls, I imagine that you get a lot more efficient with your code. Yeah, when the general manager of a GM assembly line is calling you in the middle of the night because he can't build cars, you know, you get religion on that really quick. So uh, uh, that uh, ultimately uh, started to begin my path towards changing my career over to security because we were in the 90s now and, uh, yeah, and there were uh, issues of like, how do we safely and securely remotely support some of these systems mm -hmm. and uh, the issues that I hear now about all how poorly uh, these uh, industrial control systems SCADA systems you sometimes hear about how are so open and vulnerable doesn't surprise me a lot because I was looking at that firsthand back in the 90s um, ultimately I worked on projects to develop a uh, uh, that involved cryptography on small single board computers, which is often what embedded software developers have to do. Mm -hmm. And now you don't have the gigabytes of memory that to work with like you have in a, in a, uh, in a big full blown operating system in PC, you've got 32K of RAM that you have to do encryption and mm -hmm. public key cryptography on. And that's a bigger challenge. So that there, that's when I started really getting into cryptography. Uh, I was a big fan of Bruce Schneier back in the 90s and through and on uh, since because he was one of the, his books helped me 
navigate the very, very thick waters of uh, doing that kind of security uh, very early on. And uh, eventually in the mid 2000s, uh, I found an online uh, program for to get my master's degree in information security, and ultimately went and got my certifications in it. And uh, that was how I made my transition away from software and eventually into security, which I've been working as a full time practitioner now since uh, well, uh, for a little over 12 years now, I was gonna um, say just two years, right? It's not been that long. Yeah. Otherwise, we date ourselves. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're no, talking you, 80s you, and Apple too, hey, and I was like, "You gotta oh face gosh. up to it, man. <laughs> Nothing ages you faster than the tech industry." So, you know, if you remember what a floppy disk is, you're an old guy. That's just you gotta live with it. That's just the way it is. Um, so, yeah, I uh, uh, and that's how I how I came into it. So I started learning security kind of from that ground level and going on up from that uh, and. Uh, uh, have been, and then I'm just always learning, of course, from every job that I that I work. You know, has different environments, different requirements to uh, abide by, and uh, uh, so yeah, you're 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 ne you never stop learning, which is of course one of the things I enjoy about it. And it's never a dull moment. <laughs> um, all right, so let's let's get right in. Um, what does a what does a typical day look like? Right? Is it okay. is it does it look like the Hollywood movies? You know, you have the dark room, the literally fifty seven, you know, 30 inch monitors and you guys are, you know, stacks of red, red bull or monsters. Aaron, Aaron, you look at my camera right now. Okay. It's just clutter, right? It's junk from years and years of project building. Okay. This is not a glamorous place to work. Although, uh, uh, this is, of course, I will have to caveat that this is my COVID office, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so let me back up just a little bit and explain that, uh, it, so, uh, my work for, uh, Spectrum Health, I, I work in what's called the Security Operations Center right now, or the, or the SOC, uh, for short. And I'm an incident responder. So which basically means that I, what I tell people is I'm the 911 operator when something bad happens when the alarm is pulled. Uh, I'm the one who takes the call and investigates it and figures out okay can we take care of it right now? Is it a false alarm? Or do we need to, you know, pull another alarm and call out the big guns on a mm -hmm. situation. So um, uh, when we were not in <laughs> our COVID uh, world. Uh, we actually did work in a room that was rather dark and did have lots of big monitors with lots of cool, you know, metrics and, and, and stuff up on them. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a, and which was a, a good because the uh, work of a SOC analyst, uh, uh, just like a dispatcher, uh, you have to stay calm in, uh, we, in, in the midst of chaos. And sometimes that chaos is manufactured because of people's reactions to things. And sometimes there's, there's legitimate reasons that, you know, if you were not otherwise holding your own, you, you would panic uh, because of things that, that do happen. Uh, but you like have to be- IV pumps and pacemakers and everything you know, else. Right, uh, exactly. Or, or more importantly, the threat of hacked IV pumps. Like, you know what the vulnerabilities are and you're having heartburn because you can't get the owner of those devices to appreciate the risk that those devices present to the organization, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. knowing ahead of time the possible threats and, and uh, uh, issues that could come to you can sometimes give you more heartburn than the actual incidents themselves, because those are sort of hanging over your head and the, that of the organization, like the sort of Damocles, you're just waiting for <laughs> like, oh man, this is a bomb that's going to go off and we got to deal with it. And if the uh, owner doesn't uh, uh, if uh, find it convenient to listen to you, then you can have a, a, a difficult time trying to uh, get those issues fixed. Good, good. Um, so what are, what are some of the tools that you use every day? Because again, we're, we're going to, we're going to beat up that Hollywood stereotype a little bit. <laughs> it looks like you have, you know, with all these, you know, 10 different screens, do you have 10 different tools? And with some of those tools, you know, you hear the security vendor marketing fluff, like alert fatigue and everything else. But I do know there is some truth to that. So like what tools do you use and how do you prioritize an right. alert coming in? Right. 
So uh, there, just like any toolbox, you probably use 10% of the tools 90% of the time. Uh, so there's a lot that we have of tools that we have at our disposal. And that's fortunate be, uh, working at a large organization where we have that. I've also been worked in smaller organizations where I'm the only security guy and I may still have a large toolbox, but I don't have a team or anything to help me with it. So. Um, the, the tools that I'm using most of the time, first of all, are the ones that are, can alert me to the issues, right? We can't do anything as incident responders if we don't get the alarms and the alerts. Mm -hmm. So uh, always uh, uh, logging into, you know, our ticketing system, uh, of course, email, uh, we have specific inbox, email boxes specifically for alerts to come into to notify us that something's going on as opposed to our regular email boxes that have all kinds of cruft going to them. Um, uh, uh, we uh, have um, uh, also have a, uh, a uh, what's called a managed security services provider uh, or MSSP who acts. You're doing great of, with the acronyms, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, one of my jobs, by the way, that uh, I sort of fell into in, in the SOC uh, at Spectrum Health is being one of the mentors to the new interns that are doing rotations through IS. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, I think I fell into it because I'm, I, I have to learn how to communicate with people of varying skills and experiences. And that's not to belittle them or say that they're dumb. They just don't have the experience uh, that we do. And so I, I get very conscious about just throwing about acronyms without clarifying them the first time, whether that's in a written form or speaking to somebody. So thank you uh, for recognizing that. Um, uh, so uh, those are, you know, the tools we, we initially have open are the ones that could alert us to something going on. Um, we have several tools that we use to handle um, average alerts, like an, an average thing would be somebody reporting a phishing email. We mm -hmm. want use, the users are actually our best detection tool for phishing emails because uh, uh, it, they can spot things that quite often the, before the automated tools do. Because so, you're used to their day-to-day -day email flow, right? I mean, yeah. all, these, all these companies tout AI, but in the end, as good as AI could get someday, you're the regular email user, right? So that, that you bring up a really good point. Sorry, totally didn't mean you're up. No, that's, that's fine. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, uh, don't get so concentrated, focused on the tools that you forget about the human factors. And humans are quite often one of the weak spots in a security system, but they also can be turned into one of the best assets. Uh, and so this is an example uh, where, uh, you know, we, there have been, a, I mean, yes, there, most fish that come to us are just kind of average, you know, no, nothing really bad is going to happen. Uh, but we've had a couple of people report a fish to us that actually uh, turns out to be like a whole new attack vector that we never heard of before. Excellent. And uh, we, we end up, you know, getting our shields up on it uh, long before the attack actually uh, comes to, you know, full bloom. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the kind of, that's when I think the sock really shines is when we're able to take a little something like that, dig into it and then determine, oh, this is a threat we've not yet been knew how to deal with and now we've got a we can protect ourselves from it um so what do you uh, do in yeah. that situation do you have i mean i already know i obviously know this system but for the people listening in or may not have like you said may not have the resources like what would be the next step that that compromised email comes um bc co or sorry the phishing attempt because it's not a bc at that time business email compromise yeah. comes in it does have a payload they've done the right thing. Mm -hmm. How do you investigate that? Like, how do you okay. know, right? That this is right. suspicious. What's, I guess, what's right. the next step? So the first principle when you're investigating a fish is to try and safely click, shall we say, if it's a link safe or an attachment, how do you safely click on it, right? Uh, uh, you know, what I tell the interns is you don't wanna look at this little uh, pot of something, of liquid and just go, I wonder if that's poison. <laughs> Okay. For, for yeah. people on the podcast yeah. that are on YouTube, he he right. was 
he had an imaginary um cup uh, uh, beaker yeah there you punch, go and or what was it what are those beaker. called beaker beaker and yeah. stuck his finger in and, and, and just taste a little <laughs> day, day, a little sample right you so in other words you don't want to just click on it and find out what happens right you want to find it you have a safe way to what we could say when we say detonate the email okay mm -hmm. we want to detonate the message we want to do the double click but we want to do it in a safe way so uh the tools that we have are at our disposal that are the most valuable for that are called sandboxing tools mm -hmm. and what they are are tools that where they set up a virtual computer somewhere out in the cloud for us that doesn't have anything installed on it but the regular office applications mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you can upload the email into that uh, virtual computer and double click on it and you can just you can have the nastiest most uh, dangerous malware detonated in there and it's not going to get into your network because it's isolated uh, an, uh, another uh, analogy for the sandbox is the glove box like you see the, the the guys working with the radioactive isotopes they put their you know it's inside of a box and you've got yep. these gloves, put your, put your gloves you slide in, yeah. your hand hands into it's sort of like that it lets you still manipulate the uh whatever the the malware is doing and you can click on things and see what happens but it's doing it in an environment where even if that computer is completely compromised you have not compromised anything on your network you can and uh and then after it's done it provides you with a very nice detailed analysis of all the different uh, webs, any website that the malware went to, mm -hmm. all the files that it created, the registry entries, it changed all that stuff, which is gold, because then what that does, first of all, it tells us, yep, this is malicious. But the other thing we want from that is what are what are called the indications of compromise or the IOCs. Mm -hmm. And what that means is because that person who reported the fish, maybe one person but there could have been many dozens a thousand of, other emails. Yes, right, of recipients right, right. that got it. And so what you want to do is, OK, if this is a really, really bad email, the next question is, OK, now that we know how bad it, it is, uh, what do we need to do to block it so that it cannot if somebody else does click on it and isn't as diligent, uh, how do we prevent it from damaging us? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, uh, collecting IOCs does that. You know, what websites does it go to? Okay, we're going to put in blocks for those websites so they can't do it. Now, the next thing we got to find out is okay, uh, if anybody had already clicked through to it, what's the worst that could happen? And those IOCs are the clues that can tell us, okay, let's look for those IOCs in our environment and see if somebody, you know, let the genie out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we can find out how, how, if, if any widespread, any damage has been done. Um, uh, on a typical day, uh, qu quite often these will be these phishing emails will be credential harvesters. They'll there'll be links that take you to a website that looks like Microsoft or Google, but it's really just a copy of it. And they want you to type in your email and password like you would normally in those sites. But what they really do is they just stash those away in a little database file and say, thank you very much. But you know, your password didn't work for some reason. Enter it again. And um, uh, and that and they call that's how they collect people's, uh, you know, account names and passwords that way. So our job would in those cases would be to check the log files to see did anybody actually go to that site and put mm -hmm. their password in. And if so, then we uh, follow a procedure to get their password reset ASAP. Because you bring up a good point with the use case, right? Because that's where it's like diverging. And what I mean diverging is because there's the business impact in it and there's the security impact in it, right? Because you still need the business user to be able to conduct business, hopefully, right? Right. But you are still being, have to be proactive and see where else it went. And I think that's a lot of times where people don't understand the stress part, right? Because a lot of times you guys are put in that position to where, you know, is it a false positive? Is it not? Mm -hmm. Do you have time to look at this? And, you know, I, I really, I really, really appreciate your guys' job with that. So that brings us to, um, the intelligence part of it, right? Before I ask the next question. 
So do you, are, do you guys have the ability to share that with, with peers? So when, when I say by that, like, is, is it seems like that's valuable information that you would want to push Do the tools that we have. And again, I actually don't know the answer to this question. So this is, this is good. So not talking about vendor tool type. So Jim doesn't come back and, and yell at us, but do we have the ability to share that information, right? Because if it is a new attack vector right. and we just, you know, it's preparation and it's luck. Those of us in security that have been in security while well know sometimes it's just luck mm -hmm. and sometimes it's bad luck and sometimes it's good luck. In this particular right. instance, you're talking about it's good luck. You know, the preparation of the security education, mm -hmm. they're just not sure. And you know what? It's better to be send it into the spam folder or send it to the spam team. It's better to be safe than sorry. Do we have the ability to push that information out to share to say our former colleague, Rob Turner at Bronson, right? Is there a mechanism for doing that? So, yes, there's, uh, there are, uh, the, the main one that we use um, is a system called the Information Sharing and Analysis Center or ISAC, I-S-A-C. Um, they are set up I believe by a private entity that's in some kind of partnership with a government agency, but I don't remember which one, uh, but they <laughs> some have super secret one. <laughs> something, yeah. And uh, uh, they have set up ISACs for different uh, uh, industry sectors. So okay. there is one specifically uh, set up for healthcare called the HISAC for healthcare. And uh, uh, we they are one of our intelligence feeds. Uh, so if something is going on out there, uh, in the healthcare industry, uh, for example, hey, fake COVID uh, emails, you know, uh, and and scamming uh, 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 schemes. Uh, they they would tend to post an alert about those. Like, okay, these okay. are the senders out there who are sending bad bogus information, uh, for example. Um, sometimes that information can be two-way as well. If we see something, we could report it to HISAC so that all the other healthcare subscribers could take that intelligence and use it. Uh, but most of the time it's it's coming to us. Uh, okay. we're, we're, we're ingesting that information. Uh, most of the time, we are just dealing with what with what's in front of us. So we're not like we're not sitting there with eyes on the HI sack feed waiting for something to come up and go, whoa, you know, um, uh, if, if it is something of very high uh, threatening, a, a very high risk value, for example, like, for example, when uh, solar winds uh, came out, for example, and we discovered it was compromised. Uh, they don't just like post that on a blog. They they they, they send they out send other out emails, emails and alerts. to okay. all of them okay. uh, to make sure that everybody knows this is something significant. Uh, and that's great. That's what they're there for. Um, and uh, and so those are occasions when yeah, the the intelligence definitely allows us to be proactive, and uh, uh, and and. Uh, do that. Otherwise, uh, sometimes the intelligence plays uh, a more background role in what we're doing. So for example, uh, we initially are dealing with an alert that came up on a machine that some malware may be executing. And um, if we're trying to learn more about it, that would be one of the resources we would go to to see, hey, who's got the lowdown on this such and such virus? Right. And then we can get more information that way. Uh, so the, the, that's quite often, more often how uh, we use our intelligence services. Excellent. So speaking of uh, past things that you have lived through, um, can you talk a little bit about like the, the difference when there's major incidents, right? So uh -huh. we have something like, you know, that, and we can talk about these because Jim's brought them up, you know, but the 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 intelligence being a little bit off right so we thought we had a red october uh election server issue so that's that's an example where the intelligence was too vague do you handle an incident like that differently than the WannaCry um incident that we that we had that turned out wonderfully 
<laughs> so, um, so uh, the ins so let me back up a little bit uh, and and explain to your listeners a little bit of, of where you're coming from here. Um, so one of the, we have uh, one of the things we do is part of our teamwork in, in the SOC and in the security team is we put a, we have code names when we have major incidents, when something really <laughs> oh, big happens. Thank you. And, you probably were like, right in October, what? Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, I love that book. What? You know, <laughs> right. Uh, and so um, we had, um, we did have an incident, a major incident in the SOC. So, so let me uh, first back up a little bit and explain. So uh, the, the incidents that we typically take care of in the SOC are just simply events. Uh, they're incidents, but they're not, they don't require a large response, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then we have what are called major incidents. Those are the five alarm fires where, yeah, okay, something really bad is happening or we think may be happening and we need to get managers of multiple departments on phones and have a big conference call to coordinate for to have a coordinated a, a response to whatever is going on mm -hmm. um, and those are the ones that are the most stressful uh, 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 you know again just like uh, using the 911 analogy most of them are are probably pretty uh, easy to respond to uh, but then there are those big things that okay we've got to call in people from all over to, to help because it's a difference huge, between like a house fire and an apartment complex fire right exactly right. Or, or a refinery or something right so um what um uh, so in the SOC, we, because those, that, those are definitely stressful because a lot of it is going on. Uh, 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 we, we get questions being thrown at us by directors and vice presidents, uh, you know, and, and uh, two minutes after you found out how bad is it? Yeah, um, right. Right. I'm trying to find that out. <laughs> right. Communication it really becomes the most challenging thing to keep all the factoids straight and what's developing and what do we know and what do we suspect versus what we don't know yet. Uh, the, you know, definitely um, be to be a, a good sock operator, being able to keep that calm in that storm. Uh, is very, 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 very important. What some people might call a soft skill because you don't go to college to learn it. Uh, well, and either, that's something you either have or you don't. <laughs> uh, you, you, and, well, I'll, I will say you can develop it. I think I would not you have considered, so? I would not have considered myself somebody who can, can hold himself in that calm place. But uh, one of the, my other little hobbies many years ago uh, was being a private pilot. And that taught me how to hold myself together and not just uh, uh, let the panic or fear overwhelm me because you will come face to face with that in the cockpit. And if you don't find a way to, uh, uh, to, to work with that, then yeah, you know, it could end up really destroying you. Uh, and I know some people. Figuratively that, and literally. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, exactly. I, I do know of some people that couldn't make it through flight training because as soon as something uh, unexpected happened to them, they, uh, they would lose it. And um, uh, so, uh, so that taught me, it's like, okay, the losing it is not going to help me survive this situation. So stay with what you know, you know, stay calm. That's the way to get through it and survive the best. And those experiences, I think, informed me later on in some of these experiences um, uh, where, you know, there's a part of me that can stay calm because it's like, hey, your plane ain't crashing. Right. You're not, you're not going to die. Right. So right. why do you know, no reason to get upset or, <laughs> or yeah. any of or what's going on. And so that does help the calm. Uh, and that's good because you can help lead the calmness in the rest of the team by, by doing that. And that's also very important uh, because then you won't have agitated VPs coming to you yelling, why don't we know this yet or, something, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Um, so um so anyway, because these are such big and stressful uh, events, uh, the uh, the SOC uh, has a tradition uh, of naming major incidents after uh, movies or television shows, you know, as sort of a, to a code name. And there was an incident, at which, by the way, this one predates me, but I, I know uh, uh, I know of it from hearing others telling me about it, where we had uh, some a piece of intel come in to us from uh, law enforcement, uh, a federal agency that uh, 
it has three three letters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's hard, not hard to guess. Starts with F, ends with I, and um, uh, it uh, and it, it. But it was vague. Uh, it simply said we have detected traffic to Russia from one of your public IP addresses. And to my understanding, it wasn't much more complete than that. And so what do you what do you do when it's that vague? Well, as an analyst. Yeah, well, usually throw my hands up. Uh, <laughs> what am I do with this? Um, that that's sort of that that's actually worse than getting uh, the complete information, because now you've got enough in information to create fear, uncertainty and doubt or FUD with leadership. Yep. <laughs> but with, especially with leadership, but you ha don't have enough to act on it to provide them any reassurance about what the actual situation may be. Uh, they were able to give us a, a like a very wide time frame, like between you know, like in a two month window. This is when we observed this traffic, but nothing about the nature of it, uh, nothing about, um, you know. And for the record, we have we yeah. have doctors that are Eastern European. So, yes, <laughs> like, yes. And we have Chinese. We have Chinese doctors, too. We do. We do. So sometimes, uh, you know, things well, happen that may look suspicious, but. Right. Okay. But really, they don't mean much. Right. right. Exactly. Um, so the, in that case, the vagueness of it is what created more stress than the alert itself, because we uh, one of the problems we can be asked cornered into in this sock is trying to prove a negative. Well, it, which means, uh, in other words, prove something didn't happen. Well, of course, if something didn't happen, you don't have any evidence of it in your <laughs> logs. Or so you can't you can't definitively say it didn't right. happen because right. I haven't found it yet. Yeah. Sort of like you it doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> like, you know, I, I can I prove to you that uh, Bigfoot doesn't exist? No, because I can't come up with enough definitive evidence that, to show you that. Yep. So yep. Uh, these become uh, really, really uh, stressful hunts because we're trying to calm the fears uh, for something that probably didn't mean much. And honestly, in that and particular with case, yeah. And we're not talking like hardcore right. legit media. We're talking right. the right. media that's kind of squishy, gets it a can, hold of it and then really cranks up the heat on your portal. Yeah. Media. It can be blown out of blown out of proportion very, very quickly. Um, and, uh, and honestly, uh, I don't know that I'm not speaking from authority on this because this is not an incident that I worked, but I know at least one of the factors was the fact that we provide our patients and customers with open Wi-Fi for them to use their phones. Now, they, mm -hmm. this is separate from the Wi-Fi that our our internal equipment yes. uses it's yep. it's completely yep. segregated and pretty much all it can do is go to the internet but because of that if you were you know we're anything any virus that's on anybody's laptop or mobile device when they walk into a spectrum facility is broadcasting to, out now going through to home, our, home home from spectrum from it's coming from the spectrum health right you know and that's <laughs> all you know so if somebody was phoning home and doing something with a russian ip address while they were on Spectrum's premises. Guest network, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It would be on the guest network. So uh, we've gotten better now about being able to delineate those the, the activities on networks. guest networks okay. versus okay. internal IT. Uh, and pretty much we can ignore anything that's on the guest network as long as, you know, so, but uh, that created an incident and the code name for it, because it was a Russian IP address that it was going to was called Red October. Red October. <laughs> and so that's, that is one that lives on an in infamy in the sock because of that. So what's the difference? So that one is, you know, needle in the haystack yeah. and it's frustrating in its own right. Let's talk about, let's talk about the WannaCry stuff. Cause again, we're, what we're discussing is yeah. already public information, but right. I, from your point of view, because you were involved with that one, yeah. Is it a different type of stress or is it just a different type of exercise? So it was a different type of stress and exercise. Uh, now, again, I, I, I didn't get the stress of Red October, fortunately, because that predated me. But this one, uh, this one did happen. We did have uh, an ins a, a variant of WannaCry 
that broke out and got loose in the uh, in our network. Um, and and this was my second week on the job, I might add. So, <laughs> it, so yes, there was a little added stress because of that. I didn't You're even like, have what did I get myself into? You talk about what tools we have. I didn't have access to half the tools that you know I I needed you normally do. Yep, and yep. and I didn't even have training on most of the ones I did. So <laughs> uh, I had to find more creative ways to to be helpful in that specific case for me. Um, but uh, but that was a case where it wasn't just FUD. I mean, we really did have something bad cutting loose. Now, so to explain a little bit of the context uh, to your listeners, uh, one of the things that was different about this uh, was that, uh, so WannaCry, you've probably heard of this virus before, uh, but one of the things that was really bad about it is that not only can it, in, it infect a computer by it ju just sitting on the network. It does not, okay, you do not have to be authenticated. Uh, you don't, you know, the computer, a vulnerable computer just sitting on a network is just waiting to be infected. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the, you, you do not have to have a user signed in, click on anything or anything. It could just happen all on its own at any time of day. Uh, the second thing that this virus does is it immediately starts l scanning the network to look for more machines to infect. So it's got a little scanner and it just tries different you know uh, ip addresses and when it sees a computer there it it sends a little packet to see oh are you open to the WannaCry vi virus vulnerability and if so another copy goes into that computer and takes it over and then starts doing the same thing so now you have two computers so that are scanning propagating around quickly yep. it propagates quickly and autonomously it does not require any human act in order for that for it to do that so we uh, we went from uh, in terms of our awareness. Uh, this originally came to the SOC because eventually the WannaCry computer made its way to a couple of computers that had antivirus running on it, and the antivirus system detected it, um, and so we got an alert. and And so initially we just saw the alert as, oh, we got a couple computers that have something malicious potentially running on them. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we had no idea. Yeah. That we, we had no idea that there was an iceberg under that tip. And, uh, we eventually uh, ran some other tools that showed us, oh, we don't have just two computers running this virus. We have about 50. And, uh, as we, we were growing. starting, yeah, yes. And growing. And, uh, suddenly, we're like, oh my God, you know, what is, what's happening here? You know, what, what, what is, well, a lot of questions then, like, what is this virus going to do? Like once it does infect you, besides looking for other vulnerable computers to infect, what is it gonna do to the computer it's on? Uh, is it, uh, well, one of the things we're always concerned about in healthcare is the privacy of our data. Is this mm -hmm. virus sending protected healthcare information into uh, the cloud that owned and operated Internet. by the malware operator, you right. know, that, you know, there, there was that. Um, uh, and then how do we just stop this uh, uh, from, from propagating like this? And why is it propagating? You know, we have antivirus, why is it being allowed to propagate? Um, and uh, uh, so there, there were some, definitely some moments where it was uh, very panicky to figure out how do we control this? Um, uh, long story short, uh, we had as many as 150 computers that were infected with this virus by the time we started taking countermeasures. Uh, and, countermeasures, all right, we're getting the yeah, good part here. Yeah, so this was the other part that the, so we had one part of the SOC that was watching uh, the situation, like, okay, how bad is this spreading? Mm -hmm. uh, another part of the SOC that was running down these ind indicators of compromise. We wanna know, how do we know if a machine's infected? How do we uh, eradicate the infection? Uh, and how do we know that it's no longer a threat? You know, how do we know we've successfully eradicated it? Mm -hmm. How do you know? Mm -hmm. Those are the big questions going on. And the problem was these were, you know, Spectrum Health is a very large organization. It's not just in one building. It's and in... I actually have some numbers. So going back oh, to please. when I 
And again, I'm going to butch. It's, it's, it's a good enough ballpark, right? I'd actually, uh-huh. I don't have my work laptop open because it's lunchtime. Um, but in the firewall project, so going back to 2018, the firewall project that I project managed, I think at one time we were looking at 25,000 plus internet connect device. We have many more devices mm-hmm. than that, right? Mm-hmm. So let's, let's, let's put this in context. Um, so between 25 and 50,000 devices active on the internet. So mm-hmm. think about this for a minute. Mm-hmm. I think we did some math at one time in 2018 and we were actually, our guest network was the third largest ISP in West Michigan. <laughs> okay. So, so let's okay. put that in perspective. So when yeah. people say like 150 devices, we're talking tens of thousands of internet connected devices. So right. That, but that helps you the scope, right? Because you have right. to try and pay attention right. and look at 20,000 plus devices to devices. see which ones are vulnerable. Right. And that includes, and that's across about what, 30 physical locations, you know, mm-hmm. different buildings and clinics mm-hmm. and hospitals all up and down Western Michigan. So it wasn't like we could just run through the building and just, you know, shut devices off easily. You know, we yep. had to, we had to find out so, so that was another part of the SOC uh, was getting the list, uh, trying to get, keep, keep a running list of the devices that were showing signs of infection and then figuring out what the devices are, where they're located, who is the administrator or owner of the device? Because those could be two different people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then how do we go about getting somebody to put their hands on the device to actually shut it off or, or disconnect it from the network? And so that was quite a monumental task. And fortunately, uh, you know, Spectrum Health is big enough that we have uh, uh, IT people that are hands-on in most of the major hospitals. We Shout out to our site. Our, 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 our site, CTS. Site our client CTS technology team, team site support yep. they they are our the socks boots on the ground and we love them and uh, because they can be our hands and eyes where when you know beyond where we can be in the sock uh so they were great uh for doing that uh uh grabbing those machines um but it was interesting because uh, we had quite a variety of different machines. You know, you think of your desktop computers, and certainly we had a few of those. Um, but some of the infected devices were in medical equipment, mm-hmm. and you don't just run into the MRI room and start and, shutting, and shutting things off, right? right? It's a lot more complicated than that. So you uh, you had to find out, okay, what is our uh, what's our situation with some of these uh, devices? Um, so we don't get, you know, uh, harm patients. Um, we had uh, devices. Uh, oh, uh, we had some were printers. And, and Jim talked know. to that, right? Like Jim yeah. talked to the end, to the end and yeah. finding the last of those printers. Yeah. And uh, some of them were very challenging to locate because they were in basements that, that <laughs> only one or two people knew about. And they, yeah. Uh, so it was because a lot of the, especially the big printers uh, often have basically PCs embedded within them. They're mm-hmm. running windows, even though you may not real, they may not look that way. You may not interact with them that way, but they were. And so, um, uh, and uh, so, so we had a printer, that, at least one that I'm aware of, that had an embedded Windows computer that was running it, and it was in, uh, vulnerable, and it was infected. Uh, but again, it was stuck in a basement somewhere in a building uh, that it took us. They actually, if I remember correctly, the way they identified the printer is they had somebody actually print out a test page, mm-hmm. so that somebody standing in the basement yep. could see which my printer my my manager, yep, my manager was looking around the room <laughs> and that there's... was. 30 printers in here which one is it that's exactly exactly and so that was a very clever way to quickly identify uh, the printer that needed to be pulled offline um uh, meanwhile uh i'll uh we uh the two first two computers that that were uh that had had antivirus on them uh, oh so that's the other thing a lot of these computers on medical devices and printers they don't run antivirus they don't run right. any of these security they have tools no way so, to protect themselves and we don't have a way to patch them on a regular basis because we don't technically own the computer we just you know uh so uh we 
uh, so, so we had no way of knowing uh, initially that they were vulnerable or infected or being able to patch them. But the two computers that did have antivirus running on them, uh, it turned out, by the way, they were uh, related to radiology uh, diagnostics. And so again, it was difficult. It wasn't as easy as just calling a secretary or somebody at a desk and say, yeah. shut your computer shut off, computer off because the, this impacted uh, the hospital's ability to run radiological tests on their patients. But we had, and that's a case where it was good that we had all the leaders together in one room, because when we say yeah, we've got to call. take a radiology computer offline, we need somebody a lot higher pay grade than <laughs> us approving that. And we were able to get that very, very quickly and pull them. And we actually had them physically brought back to the SOC for analysis. So we could start the forensic side of the response to figure out what is it running on these computers and how did they get infected? And uh, that that was actually one of the places that I was able to help out despite uh, not having any tools three. access because I did have some forensics experience. And, and knowledge other, with embedded embedded codes, that, yep. that probably came in handy too. Yes, yes, uh, so that, that did, that did. Um, uh, because uh, uh, we actually had to... Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, pull the drives from these computers because we couldn't, because they were embedded in radiological equipment, they were not set up like regular desktop computers that right. people, a person logs into in the morning. So we didn't have the administrator accounts to get you into these computers. The hardware. <laughs> so it was my job to pull the hardware so that I could get into these uh, discs and uh, analyze them because we couldn't log into them and analyze them like a normal desktop computer. And so that was one of my contributions. And that's good, right? Because that for, oh, yeah. for all the AI talk, guess what? There's still going to have to be old fashioned sock analysts that can put hands on it. So while, yes. while AI and computers can do wonderful things, guess what? Last time yep. I checked an AI can't crack open and the, uh, a radiology device and inspect it yep. the hard way. It's, it's great. You know, different people, different tools, different processes all coming together to work uh, for a common goal. And it, and it really was, it was a, I, in my opinion, it was a very successful major incident because once we sounded the alarm, we were able to get the resources mustered uh, that, the teams work together fantastically to uh, identify and isolate these devices. And uh, we, uh, I eventually, as part of the after action report, I had a, a, a graph that I drew that showed our under, understanding of how many devices were infected uh, uh, over time. And you're watching it climb up like this. And then there's a suddenly a precipitous drop where we were able to finally get those last devices all isolated and taken offline. And, and uh, there were just little blips afterwards and then it, it petered out to zero. So I think our response was very effective. Which, which is a good lesson for some of the healthcare listeners, right? Is that took an effort across, like you said, many different teams that weren't just IT and infrastructure team, right? right. And it was a lot of work to be able to get to that point. I know that I sat in some of the, the prep meetings and being part of the project and our former CISO, Lenny Levy, and our current CISO, Scott, when, as the chief technology officer, and just seeing the amount of work that those two did and then it branched out into the directors and seeing that directors just carried across mm -hmm. the finish line. That was a lot of that was a lot of work, but it just shows you like that payout yeah. of of taking the time, talking to your board, understand the importance of mm -hmm. investing in security. And it's it's not always sexy, right? Nope. Uh, I, you know, I do have my black hoodie, uh, you know, <laughs> if, you know if, if you want to do Hollywood, I, I could, I could do that for you. Uh, but uh, Colleague Chris a, Roberts, he, he hates that, but that, I love, that, I love, a, I love giving vendors a hard time about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, no, most of the, uh, the, uh, the average work that we do doesn't look like anything in Hollywood. And I, um, 
I used to be more irritated with that than than I am now, be, partly because uh, having somebody, I, uh, uh, another one of my past lives, I was actually a, 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 a television producer for Kalamazoo Cable Access. And I got to know cameras and lighting and story development and editing and these things. And I understand now that, you know, Hollywood is there to tell a story and it ha and what they, everything that they do has to move the narrative, right? right? And it doesn't work that cleanly in real life. Nothing ever does. Does. And so they have to take certain, we'll say, liberties <laughs> with the way things, uh, with the way things really are, uh, in order to simply tell a, two, a, move, a, a story in two hours effectively. And so I'm willing to give them a little bit of leeway on that. All but right. so yeah, not nice. every. Uh, but no, uh, uh, I, I I don't know even even the uh, the real attackers. I don't know any that actually wear hoodies over their heads as they're working at the keyboard. Uh, sinisterly, that's not really how it's done. Um, one of the things you point out that I do want to uh, give credit to uh, that often doesn't, you don't see uh, getting credit in, in these incidents is the quality of the leadership that you have. Um, I was very fortunate to experience uh, in that major incident uh, leaders who uh, at least the ones that I was dealing with were not running around with, you know, making or adding to the panic. Mm -hmm. uh, they were asking, of course, very Insecurity pointed and questions. Out, right? Not just just our office. Yes. Yep. yep. Correct. Yep. Uh, they were they were asking very pointed questions, which is their job to do so. Uh, but uh, and that can add to the stress. But that's that wasn't being manufactured. That was just simply part of the process of incident response going on. And so it's very important to have leaders that are understanding that we're you know that that that, that you still feel so supported by them, even if there's some conflict or right. uh, it, something uh, isn't going as well yep. as planned or whatever. Uh, and I always did feel supported by that, uh, the, our leadership and, and, uh, and still do. And that's a big, uh, that's hard to find sometimes uh, in, in places. I've worked in a lot Especially of different places. Healthcare. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I've worked in a lot of different industries and in a lot of different places. And I've, I've been, you know, the security guy that everybody is bearing down on because I'm not giving them answers they like. And that creates a whole lot of pressure and stress that really you don't need yep. <laughs> when you're doing it because it's stressful enough. Well, I like to end my podcast on positive notes because heaven, heaven knows that. I'm positive it's the end of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? Yeah. <laughs> um what was your we, we've talked about the hardest experience we talked about the day in life we've talked about what it's like to be in the, the mailstorm uh what's your coolest experience what was the one of the coolest things that you've had happen coolest. oh Especially boy with, like leadership <laughs> um well I'd have to say that for at least at Spectrum Health from, from my time there um, the, the, there were, there were a couple of experiences. Um, uh, definitely, uh, it's one of the things about us, even though we don't wear the hoodies, you know, over and we're in the dark shadows and things like that. Um, quite often because we're in the sock, we are often both logically and physically isolated from a lot of the what's going on from here to there, you know, and day to day, which is what we need in order to be able to just concentrate okay. on our work from day to day. So we are often out of sight, out of mind. Uh, most of the time, that's okay. We're not out there to be, to be seen. Uh, but once in a while, we do get some props and uh, 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 our uh, VP, um, our CISO uh, one day uh, had a little was traveling with our uh, uh, company CEO and their flight was delayed and so they actually uh, he actually brought her to our office and brought her into the sock totally unannounced and I and I kind of <laughs> do I, I just like turn around and just go hi hi you are the lady that I see on all those emails and yep. here you are and like okay is yeah and I'm looking to Scott like is this a good thing or a bad thing you know right. <laughs> you guys are being let go know. right you know or did we you know she really is angry and wants to tell us and wag her finger at us or something I don't know what but no it was it was totally cool she he he actually wanted her to see 
uh, who the people are that do this work. And so we gave her kind of a mini tour of the SACUS. It's, it's simply a repurposed conference room, so there's not a lot to show, but uh, we were able to show her what some of the metrics were on some of the cool monitors that we had there. She and, always has uh, good questions too. She, and she, she did. Uh, I don't remember what they were at the time because I was still <laughs> maybe a little nervous. flustered and the <laughs> adrenaline was cal calming down. But that was a great moment to just get a little recognition from the top for mm -hmm. what we did. And she was very understanding of it and appreciative. And that was really awesome uh, to get that visibility even for yep. that little few minutes. I will also say the other thing that I think is cool, and again, this has to do with visibility, is uh, Spectrum Health is very good with uh, in, not only internships at the college level, but bringing kids that are at the high school uh, level that are kind yeah, of we have information KCTC security. And yes, Muskegon, the, Kent, yep, the Kent County yep. Tentacle Center, yep. and they will bring groups of kids through to see our IT center and they'll bring them into the sock and uh, uh, I'll actually sit there. Free COVID. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All this is free COVID. All this was free COVID. And, um, uh, and take questions from the kids. And uh, there's, there's a few of them that like, wow, you can really see the eyes opening up and, and, uh, and like, whoa, yeah, this is, you know, that, that Connect just purpose. warms my, warms my heart to, yep. to see that, you know, and I really hope it uh, uh, gives a good positive uh, view of what we do and that they are inspired to go on and be uh, good technologists uh, uh, sometime in their career. Considering they're going to be taking care of us when you and I are yeah. <laughs> old and gray. Right. Well, I guess older and grayer. Older than and grayer. That's than right. We remember, are. That, remember uh, tw in, in IT, 10 years is old. So, yes, you know, is. That is so yes, is. they're going to so, put me out the pasture in five years. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're up against it. Um, Dave, thank you very much. This one went very quickly and it, it was definitely a lot of fun to do. So Good. I appreciate your time today. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me, Aaron. I appreciate it. 